Once you're settled in and you've got your Bibles in hand, I'll invite you to open with me to Hebrews chapter 10. We've been going through this really rich book, the book of Hebrews, one that is uh, often, uh, uh, I should say maybe little studied. It's often, I wouldn't say avoided so much, but it's not as studied as so many other books in the Bible are. And oftentimes it's because it is seen as a rather difficult book to study. And truly there are some places in there that require a bit of digging and a bit of, uh, a bit of uh, elbow grease, as it were, spiritually speaking. But really the payoff in this book is rich. It's, it's such a wonderful uh, story study because it ultimately leads us on a bit of, a, of, of an ascent up to the mountain of God, as it were. It takes us to the deep places of what it means to be walking with Jesus, even in the midst of hardship and difficulty, keeping our priorities straight, our eyes on the Lord, our sense of what it means to belong to the Almighty. Uh, and so we have uh, been off of this book for a few weeks over the, uh, the last little bit, but we're jumping back in and should be able to continue straight through where we've uh, picked up now for a bit. Um, but what we have covered this thus far has spoken to the idea, the concept, uh, I don't know if it's up here or not, but the idea that Christ is greater. That is the theme of the book. That's the idea that the author is wanting to convey, is that Christ is greater. Not just that we're saying that, oh, my Jesus is better than your God kind of a thing. It's not something trite. It's not something competitive. It is intended for us to understand that Christ is greater. He is superior to. He is far better than uh, in so much more than just simply a competitive sense. Uh, and so to make that point, the author of the book, who I'm sure I will accidentally call Paul, though we don't really know for sure who wrote this letter, uh, I tend to lean that way from time to time, and I tend to lean other ways the other times. It's hard to really know for sure based stylistically. But, um, but the author of the book here is intending for us to understand that Christ is better than some very specific things. Uh, he is greater than all of the voices that came before him. All of the prophets who spoke law things about God ultimately spoke of him. Uh, we have often said, and will continue to often say, that when Jesus spoke uh, to the Pharisees and said, you study the scriptures because you think that it's in them that you have eternal life, it is they that speak of me. That's an incredibly comprehensive statement to make. And it's something that only Jesus can say. Imagine hearing somebody say, all of this book that you guys read, this is talking about me. That's a crazy thing to say, unless it's true. He is greater than all the voices that came before. He's greater than so many other things. Greater than Moses. Greater than the angels. Greater than, uh, than, than even the law, as we have begun to look at. He is the fulfillment. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. As a matter of fact, the law was the very thing that the readers, the Hebrew Christians, right, those who came out of Judaism into this relationship with Christ, this walking with the Messiah, the one who'd come, he had come to fulfill the law so that it no longer uh, would be viewed as something that would bring a measure of righteousness. Because truth be told, none of us are righteous by keeping the law. Why? We can't keep it. We're hopelessly incapable of keeping the law. We might do okay in some places sometimes, but all of us have fallen short of the glory of God, which is to say none of us have met the standard that God has set for perfection. Well, obviously that causes a massive problem. How do we get right with God then? That has to be a work that he initiates and offers us to receive. Since we can't work our way into it, even as Paul would say in Galatians, I don't frustrate or set aside or negate the grace of God because if Christ, or if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ died for nothing. I remember the first time I read that. I grew up Catholic, which means that I grew up in a system where we, we don't believe in an idea of being saved purely by faith, but our works have to contribute to that as well, hence ideas like purgatory and such. That's what I came out of. The first time I ever read those words, that I don't set aside the grace of God, because if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ died for nothing. That struck me really hard. It caused me to realize that it's either or. It's not both and. You can't add something to grace and let it still be grace. If it's not all his work, then it's not his work. It's yours. And you can't have both. And so the 
problem that the Hebrew believers that the author was writing to, almost slipped there and said Paul was writing to, uh, the author was writing to, was the problem that they were having was that they were facing persecution for their faith in Jesus. They had come to believe in Jesus as their Messiah, the one who'd come to set them free. Now, initially, the Jews thought Jesus was coming to set them free uh, militarily, nationally. He was going to set up his kingdom and all this kind of a thing. He will one day. That is still coming. That's not off the table by any means. However, the first time he came, he came, as we as often as we've often said, to defeat a far greater enemy than Rome, to overtake far, far worse uh, despots than any leader of this world could ever be. He came to defeat sin, the great shackle around all of our necks, the one that would ultimately destroy us. He destroyed that first, and then he will come back and set up his kingdom. But for those who had put their faith in him in that first century, and if the disciples are any indication, there was still a very deep hunger to see Jesus set up his kingdom. Remember when Jesus rose from the dead, met with the disciples right before his ascension to heaven, they asked him a question, will you establish the kingdom then? It's not for you to know the times or seasons, but they were anticipating. If you go to Israel today uh, and you go to the Temple Mount, if your guide is anyone like uh, Avi, who took us around when we were there so many years ago, uh, when you, if you have the privilege of going under into the Temple Mount and you're, you're, they take you through that, the, 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 the paths through there, uh, there was a point at which someone began to blow a shofar off in the distance under the Temple Mount. Well, he went nuts. He just was giddy all of a sudden. You know, the idea of Messiah coming, that's still firmly in their hearts. They want this. All religious Jews want this, you know. So in the first century, when they faced persecution and difficulty and hardship, uh, they were very tempted to sort of go back to the practices and rituals and religion that they had come out of because it was safer. Uh, if you were a Jew practicing Judaism, then at least you were covered under the auspices of Rome. They recognized the religion of Judaism. So therefore, in order to keep the peace, they would allow you to practice your religion uh, as, as it had been passed on and everything. But Christianity uh, was afforded no such luxury, uh, not only by, by Rome, but even by the families of those Jews who'd come to Jesus. Uh, and as, as you no doubt are aware, even today, if, uh, if someone comes uh, in the Middle East, whether it's Judaism or, or Islam, any of the Middle Eastern Mediterranean places, if somebody comes out of that religion to follow Jesus, oftentimes they'll have a funeral for them as though they had died. So it's a very serious thing. Well, in the first century, you can imagine how magnified that was. And so it was easier to shrink back and begin to just once again go into the practices of the rituals and the religion. But the author here is saying, what really are you going back to? There's only peace, rest, salvation. There's only the right relationship with God found in following Jesus, not in putting your trust in the rituals to bring you that. And don't fall back for safety's sake. You're not going to find the satisfaction that you want. Is You're either all in, or what are you doing? So that's what the letter is written for, to help them understand the value of pressing on with Jesus and embracing nothing else along with that. Now, that is not to say, by the way, I guess I, I don't know if I've said this along the way or not, but for any, uh, if, if someone hears this later, if there's anyone here who practices uh, the various uh, uh, rituals of, of, of Judaism as we see in the Old Testament, because you find meaning in it in the person of Christ, I wouldn't dissuade that, the idea of doing it as a memorial kind of a thing. It can enhance our faith. We've done Passover seders here on Good Friday and that kind of thing. There's value in understanding the connection of this. We see Jesus in all of the feast days and all of the holy days and all of those things throughout the Old Testament. And again, they all speak of him. So there's some value in that as long as we don't begin to think like they did, that they could find some kind of measure of peace or satisfaction in the practice of those things. It's only found in Jesus. And so with that, we kind of jump back into our passage here. Now, in verse 19, we're going to be going through verses 19 through 25 this morning, where verse 19 begins with the word, therefore. We always want to stop when we see the word therefore and ask the question, what's it there for, right? Well, what's it there for? It's there for the previous two verses, which I'll read to give us the context in which we go. The previous section has led us to this point, as you might imagine. 
But verse 17 and 18 say that God has said, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great or a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near so when the author moves into therefore, brothers, it's in connection with an, an idea and a particular idea. Since there is no longer an offering for sin, since once and for all these things are dealt with, since forgiveness of these things has been accomplished and there is no longer an offering for sin, he goes on to say, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place. Not being Jewish, we often don't see the gravity, the magnitude, the enormity of those simple words. Since we have confidence to enter the holy place. Now, previously, earlier in this book, in chapter 4, we were encouraged by the author uh, to remember that we can now boldly come before the throne of grace to obtain mercy in our time of need. Boldly, same word, confidently, the idea there of having an absolute assurance and sense of being welcomed in to this special place. Uh, we can sometimes be victimized in our, in our westernized New Testament Christianity to get very comfortable with the idea that God is everywhere and there's nowhere that we really go to meet with God. We sort of just, we understand His presence fills the universe. Even David said, if I go to the heights of heaven or the depths of Sheol, you're there. Where can I go to flee from your presence? Where can I hide from you? There's nowhere. There's nowhere that God isn't. Uh, however, there is something for us to gain and understand from this concept of the holy place, uh, especially for those who are reading this in the first century, those who had come from Judaism into, uh, into following Jesus, the, the way, as it was called in the first century. Uh, and the idea of the holy place spoke, as we many times, I, I, I never want to not explain it in case someone doesn't know that's with us, but the idea of the holy place, if you can imagine the tabernacle or the temple at that time, uh, or the tabernacle in the first uh, in, in the Old Testament leading up to the temple, there was this rectangular shape in which there was the courtyard area, there was the holy place, which a, a larger area that a number of the priests would work in, and then beyond that, in this much smaller square space pla past the uh, holy place, was called the most holy place. This was where the high priest alone went in. This is where the offering was given at the Passover and everything. Once a year, the high priest would go in, and now without lots and lots of washings and all this kind of a thing. It was a big deal to be given that privilege once a year to do. So when the author here says, therefore brothers and sisters, as the idea, plural, you and I, commoners, since we have confidence to enter that place, what are you talking about? Nobody just goes in there. Yeah, you and I now can. Confidently. The high priest who was given that privilege never entered confidently. Uh, they entered fearfully. They entered with much trepidation and likely much shaking and shivering at the thought of entering into that place. Uh, interestingly, during the time of Jesus, the, the, uh, the Holy of Holies, the holiest place, uh, was somewhat vacant of somebody very important. Uh, up until Ezekiel chapter 8, there was the presence of God in that place. The manifest glory of God existed in that place. And so the, the priest, um, not unlike Moses in his, his, his interactions with God, the high priest would walk into this place terrified, wondered, amazed, awed, 
terrified, but he would do his work in that place. You can imagine the range of emotions being in the very presence of the Almighty on earth. Well, after Ezekiel 8, when God looked into that place and invited Ezekiel to sort of see past the walls that, that, that were built around it, uh, Ezekiel was shown what was in the hearts of those priests, the, the horrible sin that existed in them. And after that, Ezekiel saw the glory of God depart from that place. Now, later on, Haggai, when the new temple was being built, uh, the old temple having been destroyed, uh, the new temple is being built. Um, the older people that had some recollection of the original temple wept because of how insignificant by comparison this new temple was. Uh, however, Haggai spoke to the people and he said, don't be disheartened by this because a greater glory or a glory will once again be in that temple. And that happened when Jesus entered the temple. And so the Shekinah did not exist in the Holy of Holies per se, like it did in the Old Testament. But the very Son of God walked into that same area, that same place, this rebuilt temple. The glory of God had once again been restored, as it were. Uh, and not only that, but now we're invited to come. Symbolically speaking, there is no Holy of Holies that we literally have to walk into anymore. But we can now come into that secret place of the Most High. We can come into that place beyond the veil. We can enjoy the kind of... I mean, we don't physically see him, but the idea of being that in that kind of proximity to God is something that we need to reckon with and wrestle with and understand that this is the privilege and gift that God is giving us as a result of what Jesus has done. That's what the author is saying. Why would you go back to practicing rules and rituals and regulations when you can enjoy this? What can that possibly hold? that would make you want to go back to it rather than move forward and deepen this relationship with the Almighty that you and I have been privileged to enter into. It is a very, very enormous thing in those few words. Let us therefore, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, it's not just that this was flippantly given to us, look at the cost. By the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. We're familiar with the concept in Mark's Gospel, chapter 15, that after Jesus gave up his spirit, the temple curtain ripped from top to bottom. We say curtain, we think of like one of these things, which any one of us probably could find a way to rip. That's not what we're saying. We've described in the past how that curtain was a veil. It was like essentially a fabric wall that separated you from the holy place. It was intended to be intimidating so that you didn't accidentally or even for a minute think it was no big deal to walk into that place. It was a massive deal to walk into that place. And that veil was supposed to intimidate. So when we say it was rent from top to bottom, don't get the sense that, you know, it's like somebody just, you know. No, this was an enormous thing for that veil. It, it, it couldn't have been an accident. It couldn't have been the wind blowing too hard. It couldn't have been every priest in the service of the temple that day pulling on both sides. That was God opening the way for exactly what the author here is talking about. We have been now given a new and living way. And that, by the way, is in contrast to the old and, and death-described way of the Old Testament. Remember the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. Again, if we're not that familiar with the Old Testament, this may be somewhat new, but the idea here of, of the offerings and the sacrifices and the blood that was shed, because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. That's a concept that has run all the way through the Scripture, all the way up to the cross. In the Old Covenant, there was constant offerings, constant blood being shed, constant need for the priests to do these offerings and such. Death described the Old Covenant. But now there's a new and a living way. It's not just that the Lamb of God has died. He is also now alive. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not just another Lamb that is brought to cover over, but the Lamb of God that is taken away. Not just covered, taken away, removed, gone, no longer there. Cast it from the east is to the west. So, so far our sins from us. They're gone. This new and living way has been accomplished that it might provide for us a way into the holy place. Boom. 
I mean, that's massive. I don't even know. I wish I could have been one of those first century readers with a Jewish background just to read those words for the first time. Put yourself there. Are there words to describe the freedom that this describes? The liberation, the sense of relief and release that comes from the knowledge and embracing of this truth. I can't think of any words, really. I've had to resort to sound effects. I don't know. It's just, it's too much. But through that new and living way, the curtain that is through his flesh, since we have a great priest over the house of God. So since we have boldness, confidence to enter the holy place, and since we have a great or a high priest. The word there, I like the word for great, or some of your versions say high. The word's where we get our word mega from. Kids love words like mega. It's mega cool. It's mega huge. It's Megatron and Transformers. It's mega. It's huge. It's gigantic. It's ginormous. It's all that kind of thing. That's what the word mega means. A high priest, one who's above all things. He is, again, he is greater than. He is great. He is high. He is lofty. He is above. He is bigger than anything else that could be put into that slot. He's far beyond. That's the idea. Since we have this kind of a priest, which, by the way, no other priest was, they could be called a high priest, granted. However, there's clearly a distinction being made between our great priest and those that came before. Their work would be ongoing because none of their offerings truly took away sin. Jesus as a high priest is great and greater and mega because of what he accomplished. It's mega better than anything any other priest could do. And so since we have confidence to enter the holy place, and since we have a great high priest over the house, the house of God, look at what's next. Let us draw near. From the very beginning, you're not on page three of the Bible when man has blown it. They ate the fruit. They disobeyed God. doesn't matter if it was an apple or not. The point is God said, you can have all the trees in the garden, just not this one. Which one? You know, that's human nature, right? That's what we do. Well, man f fell like immediately in the story. You know, we don't know how much time went by and all that. But the idea is that when the, when the, off, the temptation was given, you will not surely die. Did God really say, and all the things that the serpent said, when the temptation came and they gave into it, she gave into it, he gave into it, all these things. And finally we see, if you've seen two, you've seen them all. Here we are. From the very beginning, as soon as it happened, and God came looking for them, Adam, where are you? And I think that's, I, I tend to see that question as a little more philosophical than an angry parent kind of a thing. Where are you? What have you done? Why'd you screw this thing up? I don't think that's what God was saying. I think there's a lot to that question, where are you? Where are you? Where are you at? What's, what happened? What's going on here? I think Adam was forced now to reconcile something. Ad, Eve was forced to reconcile something because, remember, they'd never felt shame before. They were naked in the garden. It didn't even dawn on them. We, we think when God says, who told you you were naked? Tell the truth and shame the devil. The first time you saw that, you thought, well, duh. You got no clothes on. How do you not know you're naked? The point is they had no shame. They had no guilt. There was nothing about their lives that caused them to think that there was any reason to cover anything. Now, all of a sudden, they were ashamed. They were hiding from God. They tried to sew things, leaves together to cover their nakedness and everything. And God said, where are you? It's not just where are you geographically. What happened? Did God know? Yes, he knew. But he's asking Adam, where are you? When they finally come and they talk about what happened, God says, the leaves are not going to do. Your efforts to cover this shame and this guilt are not going to do. And so he took the skins of an animal. Where do you think they came from? Hence, blood. And he put the garments on them. They were covered. God covered them. Temporarily, didn't take their sin away, per se, but it covered them. It caused them to realize that he would take care of their shame and their guilt. It has always been in the heart of God to deal with your shame and my shame and your guilt and my guilt. We don't have an angry 
being out there somewhere that is just looking at us with anger and contempt and disgust and wanting to just look. I, I guess I sent my son, so I got to forgive them now. There's none of that. His love for us, finally in the person of Christ, was absolutely without any question, inarguably made clear. For God so loved the world. The world. The world. Sinful, disgusting, disappointing people like me and like you. God sent his son for us. Why? Because he loved us. His desire has always been to restore us, to bring us back from that place, to bring us out of that place of sin, of, of the world, of all these things. His desire has always been to bring us to him. And here's the invitation. Since we have confidence to enter the holy place, the place that nobody could go is forbidden, verboten. You don't just walk into that place. Now we have confidence to come. We have a priest who once for all has taken away our sin. Let us draw near. There's an invitation in that. He's not grabbing us by the shirt and pulling us in. He's inviting us to come. And he has told us now in these same words that there is nothing stopping us from answering that invitation. Since these things are settled once and for all, there is no longer a reason for us not to come. Think of that. Let us draw near. When our children are little and they fall down or they hurt themselves or they realize they've done something wrong, and maybe this is even more to the point, when they know they've done something that they shouldn't do, they're afraid sometimes. They know there's a punishment coming or there's some consequence for what they've done. But when a parent seeks out a child like that and acknowledges that they did something wrong but brings them close, gives them a hug, kind of dusts them off and sends them back on their way, there is joy in that restoration. The child realizes that it's not okay what I did, but mom and dad love me anyway. Even though we're sinners, God is saying, I love you anyway. I still love you, even though. Now come, please come. So let us draw near. The idea there of moving toward, the idea of moving closer and closer to, that's literally what's implied there. Move closer to. If I move over here, it's probably intimidating because I'm so big, but the idea of, of moving closer to somebody ought to bring the idea that you want to be near them. God wants us to come and to be near him. What did Jesus say to Mary and Martha when he was over at, at their home with Lazarus and he was going to have a meal? Uh, Mary sat at his feet. Martha was busy about doing things. Uh, I love that there's two accounts of, those, of that happening, by the way. It, two different events where Jesus shows up. The first time, Mary, Martha says, why don't you say something to my sister Mary? She's not doing anything, and I'm doing all the work and everything. And what does Jesus say? He says, Martha, you're busy about all these things, but Mary's chosen the better thing. She's sitting at my feet. She's close to me. She's sitting here. She's listening. We're interacting together. That's the better thing than all the service and all the work. Now, the other time it happens, uh, same situation. Mary's sitting listening to Jesus. Martha's about her business, but Martha doesn't say anything this time. Her services, I'm sure she's embraced kind of this whole idea, but it's just funny to me that she doesn't say anything that time. So, but the idea here of Jesus inviting and saying it's better to sit at my feet, to be with me, and that kind of a thing. This is the invitation to come. The idea of drawing closer, moving ever closer. And notice what he says here. He says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. With a true heart or a genuine or a sincere heart. A heart that genuinely, sincerely wants to seek after him. Uh, I point that out because we want to make sure, to the best of our ability, that we check our hearts. It's good for us to make sure our motivations for drawing near to God are not because I think that I'm just supposed to and I need to so that I can look like a Christian. Let that facade fall away. Seek after him like David did when he was dancing before the Lord coming into Jerusalem with the ark. Uh, who was it that said, uh, you know, what a fool you look like? It was his wife, Michelle, or Michal, or however you pronounce that. The idea was that he was just reckless, with reckless abandon. I'll be even more indignified than this. I don't care who's looking at me. The ark of the Lord is back, and I'm happy about it, and I'm going to dance like crazy over this whole thing. He was unashamedly in love with the Lord, even though the one who should have been closest to him was crazy criticizing him for it. He didn't care. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm saying. We draw near to Jesus, not because it's the churchy thing to do, 
but because we love him. If you love somebody, you draw close to them, you spend time with them, you want to be in proximity to the best of your ability. Uh, Chris and I had a meal the other day, and uh, uh, and we were talking about, you know, his family's traveling right now, and we were talking about times like when they're gone now, or my wife has, like, gone to a conference or something like that. You know, the first day you get things done, and you're working on stuff, and things are okay, but that first night, though, it's hard to get to sleep. It's hard to kind of move around the house because things aren't right. Someone's missing, you know, and you miss your spouse when they're gone. There's something about the fact that there's no proximity here that just feels weird, and you don't like it. And so you can't wait for them to get home. So that's what we're saying, that kind of longing to be with. And that's not so far removed from the actual circumstance we're in. There is a distance between us and God geographically right now until we take our last breath on earth and our first breath on heaven, in heaven, the f between now and not yet in that, in that space and that tension in between, there's a longing that should genuinely and sincerely exist in the heart of a Christian. Yes, I know I have a purpose here. Yes, I know God has me here because he hasn't brought me home yet. But boy, do I want to be there. You know, that's what a Christian feels like because they love the Lord. And it's not mustered up. It's not faked. It's real. It's genuine. So therefore, let us draw near with a sincere heart, a genuine heart, uh, a pure heart, a right heart, a, a, a longing heart. Uh, and it says here, uh, with full assurance of faith. Full assurance means exactly what it sounds like. Absolute, utter confidence. He uses the word unwavering later. The idea of being unshakable, immovable. What? Confidence in the Lord. Faith is only as strong as the object it's in. And when our faith is in the Lord, it can be unshakable. It can be immovable. It can cause us to stand when everything around us falls. Let our faith be so assured in what is coming, the hope he'll speak about in a moment, the understanding that we will be with him, that it completely allows us to stand in the midst in the meantime. And remember where these people were coming from. They were wavering. They were shaking. They were vacillating. Let us draw near. And the closer you draw to God, the less influence and impact the circumstances you are in will have. Whether it's persecution, whether it's temptation, whatever it might be, as you press into the Lord, those things tend to fade away. That's why when you find yourself in a time of, of difficulty or temptation, to stop and to pray, to seek the Lord about it. Why? Because He causes you to shift your focus from whatever it is to Him. And he is mega. He's bigger. He's able to consume us, our, our hearts, and captivate us in the moment. So let us draw near with a pure heart, or with a, I'm sorry, with a, a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Uh, the idea there of drawing near, and if I can simplify what that's talking about, it's if, even a little clumsily, the idea of drawing near to him with a pure heart, mind, and body, the idea of just the sprinkling and the washing would refer to the priests, of which we are, by the way, so there's something symbolic being spoken of here. Uh, when a priest would enter the holy place, it wasn't casually. God had prescribed it, so there was a measure of confidence they could have. In other words, they didn't stay out when the responsibility was to go in. But it wasn't casually. There were washings that they would have to go through, ceremonial washings, cleansings and such. When they would bring the blood, they'd sprinkle it on the mercy seat, or they, and they'd, they'd do these things. So this speaks of priestly service and priestly preparation for what you're about to do. In other words, we are invited to, to draw near, but to not do so in a cavalier, cocky kind of a way, but to recognize what we're doing when we draw close to Him. But let me submit this to you, because it sounds like I'm saying, well, we should just run into the presence of Jesus. But be careful. I'm not, I'm not trying to be like that. But what I want to say is when we recognize whose presence we are entering into, we will appreciate it all the more if we do so with a pure heart. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord and who may enter his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart and so on. The idea there is not to put up something restrictive and prohibitive to keep us away. It is to cause us to recognize the value of purity as we walk into the presence of God because God does not abide sin in the general sense. But on top of that, you and I don't appreciate our relationship with God uh, when we are fraught with sin of any kind. And we know this, right? When we find ourselves backslidden or in sin or we've done something that we're ashamed of, we feel it in our relationship with God. 
Walk in holiness is what is being said here. Why? That we might enjoy his presence that way, fully, insofar as we can on this side of the threshold. So let us draw near with full assurance of faith. And verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Hold fast, again, is a word that is very active. It speaks of the idea of taking seriously, having a sense that we are uh, not just believing in sort of an intellectual way, but believing with the intent of acting on our belief, okay? We, be we don't just say we believe, but we also move in such a way that demonstrates the genuineness of our belief, okay? Let us hold fast. Uh, think of it this way. If you fell off the side of a ship and they threw you a life preserver, you wouldn't be casual about holding it, right? Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about salvation here. I'm just saying that there is an effort involved in holding on to that because you really, really want to hold on to because you know that there is no hope if you let go. But there is great hope if you hold on. Okay? Not talking salvation. I'm just saying that the outcome of this event has a lot to do with your willingness to act on your faith. I believe that if I hold this life preserver, they can pull me back on the boat. And I equally believe that if I don't hold on to it, I'm done. So we act on it. If I said there's a bomb in this building, guys, there's an explosive device in the building. I'm standing right over it. It's in the floor here. I saw him put it in. It's on a timer. It's probably going to go off in about 10 seconds or so. Um, kind of stinks that that's going to happen. You know, I'm not really a big fan of getting blown up and all that kind of thing. Now, none of you believe me. But if I started screaming that there's a bomb in here, I saw him light this thing. It's timer's about to go off. And you saw me run out the door full speed. Because you know I'm a goof, you might think I was kidding at first, but if you heard the tires peeling out and all that kind of thing, or if you saw me pick up Bob and push him out the door, so guys, out now, you'd believe me, right? There is an action that is commensurate with the belief. Let us hold fast to our hope, right? Why? Because that hope is an anchor in this life. I love what my, the way my pastor used to put this in Chicago. He'd say, our hope as Christians is not a hope so kind of a hope. Boy, I really hope this whole Jesus thing pans out in the end. Boy, I really hope that when I die, I really go to heaven. I hope that's true. That's not the kind of hope a Christian has. My pastor used to say, we have a no-so kind of a hope. In other words, we have a hope that we're sure of. It's not, ooh, I really hope so. No, it's, this is what I'm anchoring to. This is going to happen. Full assurance of faith, holding fast with confidence uh, the confession of our hope. We know it's true. We know we're going to see him. Therefore, it affects the way that I live today because I know what tomorrow is. The, the Tomorrow with a capital T when I go see him. He says, hold fast the confession of our hope. Confession there is a word that's, that it literally speaks of profession, the idea of, of, of claiming, verbally demonstrating, living out your allegiance to Jesus outwardly is what's, what's at play there. In other words, what he's saying to these first century Hebrew Christians is, guys, don't run back to the law and hide behind that and think that you'll be okay. Rather, move on and live out loud for Jesus. That's probably not what they wanted to hear. They wanted to hear, it's okay, man. God believes you and it's okay. He knows your heart. He does. But that's not what Paul said. <laughs> there it is. It's not what the author says. He says, press on. Be living louder about it. Be a Christian in the midst of this so everybody knows you're a Christian. Now, we want to take heed to that in our day as well. If I said, describe what persecution looks like for you personally in this life. Probably none of you have been beaten. Probably none of you have been in prison for being a Christian. Probably none of you have really had more than somebody make fun of you or maybe just hold you back for a job promotion or something at worst. Maybe as kids, maybe you get made fun of at school because you're trying to live a life that's different than your friends. And that's hard when you're trying to fit in in your age group and everything. But none of us really are dealing with a lot of physical harm. None of us are having to do with uh, having to deal with something that is truly costly to be a Christian. Which is to say, 
that this admonition should be magnitudes of times easier for us. But yet, a lot of Christians in the church today hide from the world. They don't want to be out there where the world is because it's hard, it's difficult, it's, it's influential in ways that I don't want to be influenced. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. The world will influence you in ways that are anti-Christian. The world will offer you things that have the potential to undermine your capacity to live for Jesus. Go anyway. Go anyway. Why? Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And the truth of the matter is that God doesn't need you and I to share the gospel with people out there, but he's chosen to use you and I. He didn't need Esther, but Mordecai was very wise to say to her, how do you know but that you're not here for such a time as this? And I can promise you with absolute assurance that you are where you are for such a time as this. God does not make mistakes about where he puts people and when he puts people. The problem is that we don't sometimes step out because we're afraid to. Don't. These folks had a lot to be scared of. Separation from family, thrown in prison. Paul himself uh, used to persecute to the point of death people who followed Jesus. But he became Christianity's loudest and most itinerant adherent in the first century, planning churches, missionary journeys. Every synagogue he could find, he'd be in there sharing the gospel and everything. Surely we can be Christians in our society, this nice, comfortable, middle Tennessee, westernized Christian world. We can be Christians. If it seems radical to the people around you in the workplace, it's not because you actually are, it's because they're not. It's because they're not walking with Jesus. It's because they think it's okay to just go to church. Be a Christian. Be a follower of Jesus where you are. Don't hide. Don't run away from the world. What do we do when we do that? We tell the world that we're scared of them. Be a Christian. I'm not saying everyone's going to stand on a street corner and scream about Jesus. But we can talk to the guy in the next cubicle. We can talk to the person at the store. We can talk to people when we leave here at the lunch table and stuff. We can bow our heads at prayer and not worry what the other tables are thinking. We can, we can do those things. And this is not a spanking. This is not a rant. But the world we live in needs to hear what we have to say about the gospel. I'm not talking about downing politicians. I'm not talking about that at all. That's, that's a whole thing. But you know what? Doesn't matter who's in the White House, doesn't matter who's in the White House five presidents from now, salvation doesn't come from Washington. Doesn't matter if this whole nation began to follow Jesus. Salvation's not coming from the United States. Our citizenship is somewhere else, and we're ambassadors, which means we have work to do. Let's do it. That's what he's telling them. And I would say that's what the Word of God has to say to us as well. So let us hold fast. Let's not just say we believe, but live in such a way that we live out our beliefs and hold on to that confession or profession, living out loud about the hope without wavering, unshakable, unmovable. Stand firm without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Again, your faith is only as strong as what it's placed in or who it's placed in. And he who we have put our faith in is faithful. He who promised is faithful. What does the Bible tell us? But that he, what he has promised, he is able to perform. There is no categorizing that. He is absolutely able to perform the things he says he's going to do. So therefore, there is no reason for us to be afraid. But it might become a strong persecution. They might, they might see my stuff on the internet and track me down and the guys in black will show up. Let them come. Let them come. Now that's easy to say on a Sunday morning amongst the choir. But let them come. You know what? What's the worst they can do to you? Well, they might say they might kill me or they might kill my family or they might take something away from me and everything. Yeah, maybe depending on where you live, that happens today. Maybe one day even here. Hopefully not. I believe God's given us a reprieve for a time in that regard. But who knows what the future holds? He does. That's who. You and I surrendered our rights to ourselves when we came to Christ. That means the number one priority we have is Jesus. Nothing else even comes a close second. There's no pursuit. There's no interest. There's no hobby. There's no anything that you and I want to do that even comes within a million miles of being as important as our relationship with him and being about his business. 
that is our calling. As a matter of fact, that's a not a bad segue to move into the next section, or next verse, I should say, where the author continues, and let us consider how to stir one, uh, up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let us consider, let us carefully consider, study, let us think about ways, is what he's saying, to stir up one another, to provoke, to to incite, to push, to irritate toward. That's, that's great, isn't it? Just irritate them to it, you know? Just get on them until they finally do it. Uh, to what? To love and to good works. To love and to good works. Let us draw near in full assurance of faith. Let us hold fast our hope and let's incite each other to love. You notice those three words? At the heart of the Christian experience, okay? Our faith leads us to anchor in hope, but it causes us then to provoke one another to live in such a way where our love is evident, not only to one another, but even to the world outside. How will the world know you're my disciples, but your love for one another? We're called to love them on the outside, but what Jesus is actually saying is when they see you and I love one another, they're gonna want that. They're gonna wanna be part of a community that loves each other like that. Now, in, in the Christian church, we use words like brother and sister all the time, right? Sometimes to the point of just being so casual, we don't even think about what it means, but it makes sense in the body to say, hey, bro, what's going on, man? Hey, brother, hey, sister, let's, you know, that's great, that's good, it's what we are. We're family in Christ, that's a literal truism. In the world, when we say bro and brother and sister and all that kind of thing, we, we use those terms kind of loosely, even though the truth is we don't have a genuine love for the person we're saying it to, we just say it because it's a word to say. In the church, however, that should be fundamentally different. There should never be this sense, and even though we say it casually, there should always be the understanding that at the end of the day, we're part of the kind of family that shows up at 3 in the morning when you get a phone call. We're part of the family that when someone's down and hurting, we gather around. Now, your families, people's family dynamics range from place to place to place, but there is something to be said that blood is thicker than water. Well, you know what? There is an extremely thick blood that holds us together. Which means that even at times we may not like one another, we still love one another because we're family. You know, it's one thing if you and I argue about something, but it's something else if someone else comes in and makes fun of my brother, right? That's, there's a love and a commitment and a desire to recognize the, the, the bond that we have as family that is different than the relationships we have outside. That's paramount, that's fundamental. Why? Because here in the body of Christ, here in Franklin, but globally, the body of Christ, our responsibility, according to the Word of God, is to get together once in a while and provoke one another, to push each other, to to walk with Jesus in a way that is noticeable and causes us to love one another, but also to do good works. There's no, there's no fear of legalism in these words. There's none of this, oh, if I don't do works, I'm not right with God. Christians do good things. What did Jesus say? He said, let your light so shine before men so that they may see the good works that you do. He presumes that they will do good works. Why? So that the world will see it and glorify your Father in heaven. We do good things naturally as Christians. We do things... If I really want to get philosophical and back up, we got to define what good means, right? In this world of complete, total relativism, good can mean a lot of stuff. But the truth is that God has put it in the heart of all human beings to have a conscience and to recognize when right or wrong happens. All you have to do to prove that is do something wrong to somebody, and they'll know very quickly what right and wrong is. We do things that are, by definition, good as an extension of what we are. We do because we are. Some weeks back, we talked about how being is greater than doing. But if you are, you will do. You know, uh, Jesus said you can tell a tree by its fruit. And by the way, for those uh, who know that he was talking about false prophets in the one context, in another context, he uses the same example in the completely broad sense of the term. The idea there is that when you look at an apple tree and a peach pops out, something's amiss. That's weird. That shouldn't be. Why? Because an apple tree should grow apples. Not to say that there can't be a bad apple or two that shows up on the tree, but predominantly a good tree will bear good fruit. Well, life of a Christian is the same thing. 
the predominant characteristic of a Christian life should be Christian activity. It might be that we stumble, we fall, we do something that's not quite right occasionally, but the overwhelming characteristic of a Christian is that they live differently than the world outside. That's the power of the Holy Spirit and the life of a believer that the lives of unbelievers never experience until they come into the kingdom of God. That's part of what sets us apart. So it's important for us to understand that. And then when we get together, we prod each other toward those things. Um, we shouldn't take it upon ourselves to be looking for every little way to sort of find problems in people's lives that they need to sharpen up on. That's not what I'm saying. But we should be an encouragement to one another in that regard. The word encouraging means to come alongside to stand with. It's the same root word that we get, uh, the, you know, we see interpret, uh, translated Holy Spirit. The paraclete, the par paracletos, or, or whatever it's pronounced in the Greek. Same root, the idea to come alongside. Um, when he talks about the gathering together, it's not the word koinonia. It's the same root that the word synagogue is from. The word synagogue means gathering. So he is literally speaking about Christians getting together, being in proximity, being like this. And he says, don't forsake that. Some make a habit of forsaking that, as he says. And in our day, it's easy to forsake it because there's always something going on. But he says, don't do that. There's value in getting together as the body of Christ so that we can love one another and encourage one another to come alongside one another. We, at the end of every service, we give an altar call. You know, we give an opportunity to respond to the gospel. Um, and most of the time, everybody in here is already in. But we do it because somebody may be watching, someone may be here with a friend or whatever the thing might be. We do that. Having said that, though, the Sunday morning gatherings are not so much about evangelism as they are equipping. However, there may be somebody who comes in that will respond, and people have. But the gathering of the saints is for the sake of loving one another, coming alongside one another, feeding from the Word of God, worshiping the Lord together. This is, this is our safe place every week. You know, when we go through the week and we find ourselves heavy or we're going through things and difficult stuff, maybe we've got uh, relationships at home or f friends or family or workplaces where we're not around Christians and this kind of thing, and it can be hard. We can be weary. We can be tired when we get at the end of the week. We're just, we're beat. This is where we come to, to be safe and to be able to let our hair down and be with one another, with people that love the Lord and we can worship together. And yeah, we may not agree on every single point, but that's not the point. The things we agree on are allow us to be family together. We can worship. We can just be free. Don't forsake that. Don't skip that. Don't let that become three or four or five on the priority list of your week. This is something to be looked forward to with anticipation because who knows what God can do among his people when they gather together. Uh, I remember the first time I walked into Calvary Chapel in Elk Grove Village. I was 19 going on 20. And, uh, and, and for a year, I went to that church. I went to Mass at, at 5.30 on Saturdays. And then on Sunday mornings, I went down to Calvary Chapel. I had friends who came to know, the, who knew the Lord. And they, they were, you know, they were going there. And so they invited me and I came out. And, and uh, the first time I sat in there, um, it was weird. It was like people were... You know, they were worshiping, singing, they were, they were moving to the music, and it wasn't like the music I'd known, and it was like, but I watched them, and, and it didn't take very long, though, before I realized, like, these, these folks aren't playing. They're not. They're not here because they have to be. They, they like being with each other, you know? And, you know, when I went to church, you know, you'd know people and you'd hang out. You'd get breakfast and families would get together. It wasn't like it was devoid of that kind of thing. But church was kind of like, you know, I felt like we were all there because we just had to be there kind of a thing. And, of course, as a Catholic, you have to be at Mass. It's a mortal sin to skip Mass unless you're dying or something. So it's you got to be there. But... None of these people were like that. Like they, they liked being there and, and they would hang out for a long time after church. 
And I thought, wow, this is not what I think of when I think of church. And, and, and it didn't take long when I would hear the pastor, it was Pastor Phil, and he's sharing the word. And, and I remember just hearing the Bible being taught. And my first thought was, what a great idea. It's like, you know, why, why does nobody do this? You know, and it's like, like, you know I, I mean, I'd, I'd read bits of the Bible, but someone's actually like, really? Like, he's, this is a long passage he's talking about here. And I, and I got into it. It was so interesting to me. And I saw people like, like you're writing in your Bible? Isn't God going to kill you for something like that? You know? And they had highlighter pencils, and it was like they're writing notes, and they're listening. They're really thinking about what he's talking about. And I, I just, all of that was so weird. And I thought, what, what is this place? But, it's, but it, it very quickly, I was so drawn to it, though, because they were genuinely... They, and they loved being together. They, they loved hanging out, and they would, you know, I'd see people talking to different people all the time and stuff. It was just, it was, it was beautiful. Well, as an unbeliever, that was huge. I mean, I, I saw something that I, and I had good friends. I had buddies. We hung out and we did stuff. But it was like, they had not only that, but they had God, too. And I thought this, and I thought I knew God. So I wasn't coming from some in the, you know, in the gutter kind of a life or something. I already thought I had it pretty good. And still, don't forsake the gathering together of the saints. This is a magical time for us, if I can use that word. It's a time when we gather together and we spend time with one another, total strangers, even a couple of years ago, even an hour ago. But here we are. You know, the world doesn't have things like that. They run as deep as what we have. Don't forsake that. It's a gift from God. It's a beautiful privilege and a, and a, and a joy to come together with the saints and to spend time loving one another, being there with one another, praying with one another, learning about each other so we can draw closer and closer. It's, it's, like, it's like as we climb the mountain to God, if we all start on different parts of this mountain climbing up there, we're all by definition getting closer together as well as we get toward the apex. That's what the Christian life can be. So the author here says, don't forsake that. This is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. And I'll close with that thought is the idea that A, the day is drawing nearer, the day, not just, you know, tomorrow, but the day of the Lord, the day of his coming, the time when the last day of the order of things in this earth ends, that day's coming. And he also implies that we can see it coming. We can recognize it. As we look around the world here, there's no shortage of issues and problems and things that are going on that, that rub us the wrong way, leave us feeling like, oh gosh, Lord, how long till you come? You know, there are things that as Christians, because we've tasted and seen what's on the other side of this whole thing, when we see the world around us, it doesn't hold interest for us anymore. As a matter of fact, we're often repulsed by it. Because we see that, and Jesus said that conditions leading up to his return were not going to get better, they were going to get worse. And because we can see that, the natural response to that should be to hunker down together, not to avoid being out there and being a witness, but to let these times be the special times they ought to be as we come apart for a while, even as Jesus invited his own disciples to come apart for a time and to pray and to rest before he sent them back out. Same thing. Sundays are like that. Wednesdays are like whatever days we gather with our uh, with with other believers. These are special times that should not be avoided, but but should be sought after with passion and with desire and a longing to be with, so that we can experience all that comes from that. That is what the encouragement for believers are, and that never meant more to anybody than it did to those in the first century or to those who today suffer lives of persecution for their faith. Don't let the casual nature of our society and the fact that it's not difficult for us here in, in, in westernized culture, don't let the fact that we don't have to suffer persecution keep us from recognizing the value of fellowship. One day it may be that we really cling to it because things have gotten so bad. I'm not hoping that ever happens. I'm not like that. But it could be. We shouldn't feel like if it, it can't happen to us if it's happened to other people. Don't let it take that to draw close to one another in Christ. We're family, brothers and sisters all in the body of Christ. Enjoy that. 
So the author continues there. Now next time we're going to talk about what's generally been seen as a very difficult passage where it talks about, you know, once you've received the knowledge of the truth, if you continue willfully sinning in that. And that can be a difficult place. But I wanted to build this up today and not go into that today because this is what a Christian is or should be about or embraces. So we talk about next time. Remember that the words we'll study next time are built in the context of this setting the stage to draw a contrast. So read ahead. So I always encourage you. But but as we come to a close today, let me finish uh, by praying for us and we'll, we'll worship and we'll hopefully spend some time here together, uh, even enjoying the, the shower and all. But Father, we want to come before you and thank you for your word. We thank you for the beautiful, the beautiful invitations that you've given us to, to draw near, to recognize that there's nothing standing in the way for a believer to come deeper. So help us to take advantage of that, to, to dive in unabashedly. Help us to hold fast the profession of our hope, to know, to recognize that you are faithful to us, and so we have nothing to fear from the world outside. So help us to be Christians, to live Christianly, to let you live your life through us as we seek to live in that resurrection power in this world around us. I pray that the world would see in us a place to come and to know you and to find that there's a community of believers that has been impacted and transformed by you and by your love and your grace. But help us to be out there so people can see that that really exists. And lastly, inside the church, help us to prod each other, to provoke one another, to, to live that life of love and good service to you and to one another. That, Lord, we might demonstrate again outwardly what a community of believers looks like as you have taken hold of our hearts. And, Father, if there's anyone in our midst here, or maybe who's you know, listening or watching later that doesn't know you and has heard these words and has found that their own hearts have been pricked by the Holy Spirit as they realize that they're outside of such a community, that they've not come to put their trust in Jesus as these people apparently have. And this is something that has stirred them. Uh, if that's you, then I want to invite you to pray with me. We've talked about three invitations today. Well, there's an invitation that even precedes those, and that is to come and experience the grace of God for the first time, to enter into that relationship with Jesus through his finished work at the cross. He paid for our sins, past, present, and future, one time at the cross. It's done. It's finished. It's over. It's paid in full. So now you can come, and you can receive that free gift, that gift that I say free. That's terrible. It wasn't free. It's just been paid for by the Lord. But you can come and receive that gift salvation, of relationship with God that lasts not only in time but for eternity. So I invite you to come and pray with me now. Heavenly Father, I confess my sin to you. I am a sinner. I have broken your law and I'm guilty. But I do believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins once and for all. And I put my trust in Him and Him alone. And now I pray that you would help me to walk with you, to follow you. Fill me with the Holy Spirit, that I might walk in the Spirit and walk away from the temptations that have so consumed my life. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Now just give me the strength to follow you until I see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'll invite you to stand as we sing a closing song together.
grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that you have raised the broken, the dead to life. Thank you for your goodness toward us, Father. We ask you to go before us, taking us by the hand through this life. One day we'll see you face to face. Empower us now to live lives that are expectant and active. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.